Another great interview for you guys here on The Young Turks. Robert Greenwald, uh, an old and dear friend, uh, and not just of us, but of you guys, having done movies like Uncovered the War on Iraq, Out Fox, Rupert Murdoch's War on Journalism, Walmart, The High Cost of Low Price. I'm going to keep on going because these are all <laughs> awesome. Iraq for Sale, The War Profiteers, Rethink Afghanistan, Koch Brothers Exposed, War on Whistleblowers, Unmanned America's Drone Wars. These are uh, the progressive movie of our lives, right? And Robert is. Uh, the person behind all of that of Brave New Films. We've got a new movie out, Making a Killing, Guns, Greed, and the NRA. Now, you're giving it away because you're crazy. You're crazy, <laughs> dog. Okay, uh, and, and I like how you're bragging that, no, it's not balanced. Okay, <laughs> we're going to explain the real story here and not give you some sort of false neutrality. But before we get to Robert, I want to show you a trailer for the movie and then we'll come back and talk about it. I was just staring at him and he just stared right back at me and that look in his eyes, it was like you're dead. I heard Carrie's mom screaming in the background. Terrell was at church. Somebody came by shooting and Terrell was shot. People are getting up, running, screaming, jumping over each other. And AJ grabs my hand and took two steps, and I felt his hand let go. One begins to understand that this is a lobby for the gun manufacturers. Why would anyone trust the NRA when the gun companies are paying much of their salaries? You don't hunt with an AR-15 unless you're hunting humans. Gun companies want to sell guns. You know, they're selling death. Well, I really like standing up there with Wayne LaPierre and handing him a big fat check. The NRA gave Brenda and I gold jackets because we give them a lot of money. He said to me, she's gone. <laughs> Just standing there and telling my father, don't shoot. <laughs> we are dying inside. Something's got to be done. This is happening too much every day. When something's wrong, say it's wrong. And if you can do something to make it better, you do. You shouldn't be able to go out and buy a gun like you buy a loaf of bread. I don't understand how this is still happening in the United States of America. I can't do this alone. The day is the day, now is the time. Jesus, Robert, you did it again. So that was powerful. And that's just the trailer. And you know, I I talk about it on the show. Definitely every week. Sometimes it feels like every day. But it's different when you see the blood, and it's different when you see that girl, or that woman who was killed, and you're here in the nine one one tape. Um, you see that kid talking about his, how his dad put a gun to his mom's head, right? Jesus, that's powerful. Um, so first thing is because everybody, I think, is going to want to rush out and watch it now. Uh, wh where do they get it? Well, we're doing um, screenings now. We're and our goal, by the way, which we're going to meet, is to have a th have it one of the most widely spread documentaries ever. A thousand screenings by Labor Day, and you can go to makingakilling.com and you can do a home screening, church, school, bowling alley, sports league, anything you want. Uh, in order to get a hundred thousand people taking an action, because mm -hmm. again, for us, it's not just seeing the movie, which of course is important, but making sure people will do something. So, makingakilling.com, and it's one hundred percent free. Free. Okay. So, uh, first, let's talk about the violence, and I want to talk about the money, because right, the money is a huge part of this story. So how many people did you guys follow there? How many storylines are there of, of real people affected by gun violence? <clears throat> well, we follow five different stories, each one a different aspect of gun violence, and it's been two years that I've been 
traveling around the country and interviewing people. And as you know, Chink, I was to Afghanistan, I was to Pakistan with the drone survivors. But day after day, week after week, talking with people whose lives are permanently impacted, in some cases destroyed, three different mothers telling me that they wanted and tried to commit suicide because of the loss of their children as a parent. You can understand that. Mm -hmm. And there's something that's so, because it's completely unnecessary. I mean, war is bad, but it is war. Here it is our country. And so five stories, we have a suicide story where a young woman was engaged, her fiance, no mental health problems whatsoever. Six weeks before the wedding, he hit a bad patch, was depressed, went out, because there's no waiting periods on guns, buys a gun and an hour later shoots himself. Uh, Two-thirds of gun violence is suicide, which I didn't know before. Suicide is an impulse. If you don't act on it, there's a 92% recovery rate. We have domestic violence. I didn't know that either. Yeah. Yeah. So if there's, a, let's say, a, a three-day waiting period, just make up a number. Three hours. Three, three hours would say be saving lives. Okay, so let's say 24 hours. Yeah. Just a 24-hour waiting period. They, they want you to do that for, in the case of abortion, right? They want you to have a 72-hour waiting period in some of these places because they say they're pro-life, right? Well, so if we just had a 24-hour waiting period, how many suicides could we prevent? Would be, we don't, I mean, because we, we don't have it, we don't know. But in the film, we show a little, uh, in one state, they call it a think before you ink. 72 hours before you can get a tattoo. Right? <laughs> but, but not, with the, before, not, you not before you're gone. Guns like that. Crazy. Nuts. Yeah. Now there's a new trend I covered on the show today in Georgia there, and I'm sure they're new in other places too, but the uh, local uh, fire department there said that they get two to five calls a week. They're putting two chemicals together and making bombs. Mm. And then now they're starting to shoot the bombs. And like in another story, they uh, just a couple of days ago, they, some guy shot up his neighbor's house, kids are in the house, and they yeah. said, why'd you do it? He said, I don't know, I have a gun. What else was I gonna do with it? I had to shoot yeah. it at some point. And the guy who shot the bomb in Georgia today blew his leg off because the, he put it in a lawnmower and the lawnmower blew apart and took his leg off. Now, it's one thing when you hear that story like we did today, but we didn't have the, the yeah. pictures you have, right? right. And, and if you see the guy's leg off and the blood everywhere, you go, oh, I get it, guns kind of kill people. And you see the relatives, the people who are impacted, you know, because of suicide, everyone around Kerry, his fiance, his mother who talked to us, his fiance's mother, you see domestic violence. Uh, Kate was there and her son Will was three and a half years old. He sees his father break in, try to shoot his mother, try to shoot his grandfather. I mean, you know, it, the stories can go on and on. A mother whose son goes to play with a neighbor, 13 year old boy, son pulls out a shotgun the father had there, fully loaded shotgun, not locked, not in any way protected, kills the young man and she's never gonna see her son again. We also do a section in Chicago around trafficking where you know the NRA cites Chicago, well, gun laws don't work. I was on the south side of Chicago, it was worse than in Afghanistan or Pakistan. Every person I spoke to had multiple people who had been shot by guns and it's because of gun trafficking goes to gun stores, goes to gun shows, goes to profit in trafficking. And the laws are not national laws, so they have no impact there. And finally, we do Aurora and assault weapons, where we take seven different people, all of whom are going to the movies, normal thing, a waitress, and then they wind up in the movie theater. Oh, God, it's gut-wrenching, especially when you see the family members. You yes. see them crying there. So, um, if, first of all, if you're a gun advocate, watch the movie. Because if you can stomach it, okay, that's fine, right? And so just know the decision you're making. I know they, everybody thinks, oh, no, no, my gun would be locked. Uh, I'm a responsible mm -hmm. gun owner. Except every day there are dozens of stories where people who thought they were responsible, they made a mistake. Except you make a mistake with a gun and, and a 13-year-old or a 2-year-old or an 80-year-old dies because somebody picked up the gun. Right? And because they will not have the simplest laws. I mean, here's where the gun company and the NRA are completely responsible for fighting simple lock, a, a lock that would cost $13 to put on a gun or a safe storage bill. I mean, that's the other tragedy here. So many, you know, wars are horrible, but they're complicated. Mm -hmm. Here there are simple solutions and these families would have survived and people's lives would be dramatically different had the NRA and the gun companies not focused on greed and profit.
be a man, watch the movie. If you if you think, hey, Second Amendment, Second mm -hmm. Amendment, all right, be a man, watch the movie and go, okay, I'm fine with it, right? So at least make a conscious decision and, and don't hide uh, behind not knowing the real story. Well, and you know, 74% of NRA members are in favor of background checks. So the NRA is no longer serving its members. That's completely clear because they're a lobby for the gun companies. So that, that let's talk about the Chicago story because that ties into the money. Um, <coughs> The NRA often fights against laws that allow you to track the guns better. Now, if you only wanted the good guys with guns, what would be wrong with tracking the guns? Uh, they fight against uh, safety uh, uh, features that would allow only the gun owner to shoot the gun. So when they, when a young kid grabs a gun, he can't shoot it. Uh, or when a robber or a ra rapist or whoever comes into your house, he can't use your gun. Now, what on God's green earth could be wrong with that? But they fight against it. Is it is it just? No question about it, it's to sell more guns and they don't give a damn? Well, yes, the pr predominant thing, and you know, it's people convince themselves of things when their paycheck is written um, mm -hmm. by people who are buying guns. And I'm sure they believe some of the ideology, but over and over again, they will not support anything that limits guns. Why? Because they are selling a culture of fear. And people have to be convinced that I can't lock up this gun because two seconds would cost me my life, the hundreds of people breaking in and invading my house. Complete and utter nonsense. People, factually, there's data, you are less safe if you have a gun in the home. No question about it. Um, and the gun companies and the NRA do a very, very good job of selling that fear, selling that paranoia, and profiting. Wayne LaPierre makes over a million dollars a year. We have photos of the homes of some of the gun company owners and some of the NRA folks, and it's, the evidence is there. Would you be safer if you had a nuclear bomb in your house? I think most people would say, <laughs> no, I don't, no, 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 don't put it in the basement. God, God forbid it goes off, right? Uh, would you be safer if you had an RPG in your house? I mean, God forbid it goes off, right? Yeah. But a gun is much easier to use. It's far more likely to go off, yes. right? Yes. Uh, than those things. But, and I, you think, oh, again, this, the stats, and I don't know if you have them off the top of your head here. I mean, the percentage chance that, uh, that uh, somebody's going to bust into your house and you're going to be a hero and you're going to save yourself versus suicides, homicides, et cetera, that goes on inside the house because you have the gun in, in the house. I, I mean, it's not even the same universe. It's so radically different. And with domestic abuse, by the way, a woman is 500 times more likely to be shot and killed or injured if the domestic abuser has access to a gun. I mean, the numbers are staggering. But ultimately, what the film tries to do is take the deeply personal stories, the emotional stories, and see we could be one of those people. We could be going to the movie theater, mm -hmm. or, or our child could be playing next door, or you know, we could have a friend who's depressed. Take those personal stories and then connect it up to policy so that we make that emotional connection, which then leads to the head, which then leads to action. I believe, and what we try to do in most of the films, is start with the heart and then go to the emotions. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And so in this case, when we talk about the numbers and we go to the brain, um, I think a lot of people get it when you see that number up on the board. Wayne LaPierre makes, what, over $890,000 a year? Yeah. That's a lot of money yes. to come up with slogans like, the only per thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. That's worth $900,000? And apparently there's more money. We haven't been able to authenticate it, but there's lots of stories that we're researching. And if any of your viewers or listeners, please email us, because there are other areas where he's also making money. Why is the head of the NRA, is the NRA a nonprofit? Yes, well they have, yes. Yeah, okay, that's ironic and funny, mm -hmm. right? But the gun manufacturers pour money into it, right? Um, why is the head of a nonprofit making eight hundred and ninety thousand dollars? Like, if I thought he did it for the love of guns, <laughs> yes, I thought yeah. he was a Second Amendment enthusiast, right? I, I, if he was an entrepreneur or whatever, I don't begrudge him the money, mm -hmm. right? He, he, whatever, he's a doctor, he's a dentist. You want to make money, go for it. But when you make money to lobby for the gun manufacturers, and they're paying you for that, yes. Let's be. I mean, you know it. Even if you're the biggest Second Amendment enthusiast, then you know that they're paying Wayne Lapierre for propaganda. And they have been for years and years. The NRA at one point did represent hunters and you know sportsmen. That's long gone. And now the gun companies, and again, we have checks, and we show in the film different gun companies handing Wayne LaPierre checks, a gun company head speaking up and saying we need to support the NRA 
because they're our voice in Congress. I mean, over and over again, the evidence is clear and it's out there and it's legal. Uh, <coughs> there are some aspects apparently which are questionable, but for the most part, it's legal. And of course, you know that because you've focused on money in politics and how money influences the legislators. So how do we fix it? Um, uh, look, if, but by the way, before we get to that, one more uh, on, on the issue of this, the 73% number you mentioned of, of NRA members saying, for God's sake, federal background checks, mm -hmm. right? So has anybody ever asked the NRA, why are you against 73% of your members? And, and again, if you get, if there is, you're a Second Amendment guy out there and you're a gun rights guy and stuff, didn't you ever think, well, wait a minute, if they're representing their members and three quarters of their members are for federal background checks, why would they be against it? Maybe they're representing someone else. Come on, yes. do, do the math, yes. right? But has anyone ever asked them? I don't know. We're not on speaking terms. <laughs> 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 they don't return our phone calls. Okay. Um, um, and they're very smart in their messaging, and they're very smart about also going on the offense. They're smart about looking at these things from a long-term point of view. In that sense, similar to the Koch brothers, you know, that we discussed when we did the Koch money, they take a, a view of this. This is long. It's going to be time-consuming. Find out all different ways, different laws, local laws, state laws, federal laws, and keep pushing, pushing, pushing. And now, fortunately, for the first time, we have groups and organizations and people who are pushing back. The film, we're working with over 120 organizations already who will be using it in a whole variety of ways. And there is victories going on on the state level, not at the federal level, but fortunately it's beginning to shift um, ballot initiatives, electing the right people. Um, you know, there are lawsuits. There are a whole series of different things going on. Because, I mean, for me personally, Wherever I am in the country, I travel all the time. But my family's in New Jersey, it's in in here in in L.A., but in Oklahoma, I've all these different places that I have family and friends. Uh, the likelihood that they're going to be a victim of gun violence, as opposed to the likelihood of them being a victim of terrorism, is just night and day. It's yeah. overwhelming. Yep. So I'm much more uh, worried about gun violence and would want to take action to prevent that. Meanwhile, I bring up Oklahoma because I've got a family member there, and they're busy passing Sharia, anti-Sharia law uh, bills. <laughs> like, yeah. like that's a real threat in Oklahoma. Yeah. I mean, it's a sickness, the fear that they have bred, which is ironic because if there's one thing you should be afraid of, it's guns. Exactly. <laughs> right? Yes. But they flipped it on its head, didn't they, Robert? That they like you should be so afraid of guns that you should buy another gun. Exactly. You yes. You have to have one because everybody else does now. Not just one, multiple guns. Every, virtually every single shooting, we found that the whether even the, the guy, the father who owned the shotgun, five, six, seven guns. Kate's ex-husband, he had seven, eight guns, and we, you know the police confiscated them. Of course, then he could go right out to a gun show and get as many as he wanted. So if you've got eight guns, you can't wait to use them. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's just, and it's paranoia. It's the oh my god, not one is enough. One in the living room, one in the kitchen. One. I mean, who knows what, where, and how they put all these guns? Right. And then once you put one in the couch and one in the kitchen, somebody's going to find one, yes. and one of them's going to be unlocked. Yeah. Right. So um, now to what people can do about it. Um, is it? Do we have to go local because is, is national nearly hopeless? Well, I never think anything is hopeless, but <laughs> it, de it depends. I mean, what we try to do with the films, as you know, is offer a menu of possibilities because everyone has a different way they can participate in a different way they believe in. So there'll be people doing civil disobedience on one end, people working on elected officials nationally, people working on state officials, people working on ballot initiatives, on lawsuits, on organizing, fighting uh, campus carry. You know, there's probably 10, 15, 20 different things. And social media, I mean, as we know, it can have a real impact. Yeah, and that's what I love about the film being free. We're going to have 31 minute clips that people will be able to use. We've started putting oh, them up that. now on Facebook, on Twitter, wherever you are. There'll be three minute sections and five minute sections and 20 sections. And maybe your issue is domestic violence. We'll just take the domestic violence section of the film. Or maybe your issue is suicide. Just take the suicide section of the film. It sounds almost like Larry Lessig's strategy on, on getting money out of politics. Uh, strike the tree at, uh, from all the different angles until it falls. Yes. Right? <laughs> yes. Um, so what is your ideal? Um, and now they, uh, the, 
the guys on the right say they were going to take all your guns away. Uh, and almost no politician in the country, not almost, no politician, no politician. in the country <laughs> actually uh, has that uh, policy. Uh, I would, mm -hmm. okay, uh, I would say, okay, you do have a, um, first of all, you, you don't have a Second Amendment, right? Second Amendment says in a uh, well regulated militia. If you join a well regulated militia run by your state, then we're having a conversation. <laughs> Otherwise, that's not the case. But I, I would allow for guns because pe hunting is real. I know mm -hmm. families who lived off of the stuff that they hunted, right? Poor families in Texas uh, that would hunt for rabbits so they could have dinner. Like, it's, it's still real, it still happens. And besides, which, even if it's not for f food, you want to go out and hunt in the middle of Wyoming, I'm not going to stop you, right? But I, I, I would have your gun uh, locked up in a place where you'd go and take it, you drive there and go, okay, I'm going to go hunting, give me my gun. You'd go, and, and you know the number of homicides and suicides you would prevent if you did that? It would be immeasurable. And you make sure that people have training, that have to get a license, that have to go through a process, like you do for almost anything else. Here's a weapon that's designed to kill, and you can get it without any training program. One of the things we have in the film is, like to be a massage therapist in one state, you need 100 hours of training. To get a gun, zero. Oh, come on, man. I mean, look, again, even if you're a gun enthusiast, you've got to admit, if we need a driver's license to operate a car, and a car is not that complicated, <laughs> yeah. right? We should at least have some small process. Can we not agree on that to make sure that the person getting the gun knows how to use it, it knows how to be safe with it, right? God, I remember we had a whole class in high school on how to be safe with our cars. Yeah. A whole semester of it, right? But guns, ah. They're designed to kill things, but have fun. Okay, no training. But that's why I think we're going to win over time. You know, the argument with cars and with cigarettes, same with for-profit products, which is what a gun is, a for-profit. Oh, no, it's not the cars. People. Cars don't kill people, bad drivers. Therefore, you don't need safety belts. Therefore, you don't need uh, barriers. Therefore, you don't need speed limits. Same with smoking. We should be able to smoke any place. And you look back now and you say, how did we drive without seat belts? How did we smoke every place? I really believe with guns, we will look back and say, how did we let this craziness go on for so long and kill and injure so many people? There's no question about it. It's just a matter of when our politics gets back to sanity. Because, so for example, and we, we all grew up in the propaganda. So when I was growing up, uh, everybody smoked. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Uh, especially, I came from Turkey. Man, oh. like 112 percent <laughs> yeah. of the people in Turkey smoked. Yes. Okay. So, and I remember being in a bus and everybody smoking inside the bus. Yep. And so I always thought that's that's what you do. Mm -hmm. That's normal, right? And then people started making the argument about secondhand smoke. I was like, that's a pretty good argument. Mm -hmm. Why am I in a bus and I'm not smoking, but I'm getting the same smoke in my lungs that they are? If they want to kill themselves. That's one thing, but they're killing me, right? So then we said maybe not in restaurants, etc. Right? Guns. How about secondhand bullets? Yeah. You know, you're worried about secondhand smoke. You know what? It'll kill you. Not in 20 years, but right now is a secondhand bullet. So you, you know, there's the old saying in law that your rights end at the bridge of my nose, mm -hmm. right? Well, your guns fire bullets that go in different directions, and it's not fair. You, you think you have these Second Amendment rights, even though you're not in a militia and you just want to ignore the first part of the amendment. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine, 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 right? But how about my rights? Yes. I got a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's exactly right, and that's why, again, I'm convinced we're going to win, because your rights and your safety, the safety of millions of Americans is at risk because of a teeny percentage that wants to be able to walk around and have a gun and shoot whenever they feel like it. So I laid out my case, which I'm sure the gun <laughs> advocates would consider extreme, yeah. et cetera. What's your ideal for, what's the gun control that makes sense to you? Well, what, there's what makes sense and then what I personally would like. I think mm -hmm. what makes sense is a series of laws starting with universal background checks, starting with waiting periods. Very simple, doesn't stop anybody who believes they need seven guns, but it helps take the guns away from people who shouldn't have them. Think of all the violence recently and all these terrible shootings. Can you imagine if the shooter had a baseball bat? He still mm -hmm. would be a crazy person yep, mentally, yep. but it, what a difference having a baseball bat versus an assault weapon in terms of what would have happened. Well, that, that's why every once in a while there'll be a mass stabbing in Japan or China, like once a decade yep. or so. And people be like, see, it could happen. Yes. I'm like, first of all, no, it happens once a decade. Yeah. Second of all, you know what happened? Oh my God, seven people were stabbed and they're all okay. Yeah. Like it was terrible, but they're in the hospital and they're fine. 
if that guy had a gun, there'd be 17 people dead yeah. and 34 injured, right? Because yes. they're designed to kill things efficiently. Yes. That's the whole point. And knives have a second point in the cars. It's this old, tired argument. It's like, oh, you can kill somebody with a car. That's true, but they're not designed to kill things. They're supposed to drive you from here to the grocery store. That knife cuts bread. It uh, butters your bread. It, it has <laughs> other purposes, right? Yes. A gun's only purpose is to kill things, yep. among them people. And guns are now, like in the state of Washington, guns are killing more people than cars are this point, mm -hmm. car mm -hmm. accidents, mm -hmm. and that's building in terms of young people, too. I mean, again, the, the good news is less and less people are owning more and more guns. I mean, good news in terms of that populace is shrinking. But what do the gun companies do? They make the weapons more lethal and more powerful so that the smaller number of people buying have a reason to buy more guns and to buy new guns and to keep going at it and at it. But because that's a shrinking population, again, it gives us and will give us the power to legislate sensibly. You know, finally, Robert, there's, uh, I think there's an advantage in being right. <laughs> yes. Okay. So yes. oftentimes yes. in, the, in yes. the short run, yes. not necessarily yes. the case, but in the long run. So I was in a room with, uh, politi with politicians and, and some corporate leaders, and we talked about the, how a corporation is built, right? It's built to maximize profit. Right? And it doesn't have a second directive. It only has the prime directive, which in its case is maximize profit. It doesn't matter. There is no morals. And I said, can we get everybody to agree to that? And everybody's like, well, yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, if I don't want to agree with it, that's a sad day for me because yeah. that's, that's what it is by law, right? Now, we're going to eventually get people, I think, to admit the gun corporations, weapons corporations, also only care about maximizing profit. By law, they have to only care mm -hmm. about maximizing profit. There is no morality in that equation. And once you take morality out of a company that makes killing machines, right, and in this case guns, well, the way you maximize profit is if you sell more guns that kill more people. Yes. And the more people that die, the more scared people are, and the more guns they need. That's exactly right, and we, and we see it, right? We see an entire culture now where a segment of that culture is built on fear, fear, and fear. And when you get scared, people do act in ways that are terrible and awful, but if we can touch that fear responsibly, if mm -hmm. we can connect to that fear and say, you know what, you're going to be safer if guns are not here and there, again, it gives us an opportunity to be successful. And, and if there was a magic bullet, sorry for the pun, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know me, I'm going to say it's money in politics. What do you mm -hmm. think? Is it money in politics? If we, were, if we got the, the politicians to stop taking money from the NRA and the gun manufacturers, is there a chance they would listen to 90% of Americans uh, who want federal background checks? Yes, no question about it. I mean, it's money in politics and it's lobbying too, which you know, mm -hmm. you're seeing some of the recent studies which are... In some ways, companies are putting not quite as much into direct buying, but in lobbying, which can be even worse because they yep. know the laws and all of that. But that would be a radical, radical change if when we're able to do that, not if, when. Oh, I like that way of thinking. <laughs> all right, Robert Greenwald, as always, great, Thank you. great work. Everybody check out uh, the new movie by Brave New Films, Making a Killing, Guns, Greed, and the NRA.